Part 1. You will hear a man inquiring about a gym. First, you have some time to look at the questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Fitness Life Gym. How can I help you? Yes, I've just moved to the area and I'd like to get some information about your gym. Certainly. What would you like to know? Firstly, I want to know what hours you are open. I want to come very early in the morning and I need a gym that opens early. Well, sir, we never close. Fitness Life is open 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, so you can come as early as you like. That's perfect. Do you have classes 24 hours a day too? Not really. They are mainly during the day. There are very few classes during the night as we have no call for them. What type of classes would you be interested in? I'd like to do some kind of cardiac class a few mornings a week. I find classes much more motivating than just working out by myself. We have a wide selection of classes that go all day from 6 a.m. After 10 p.m. we only have a weights class at 2 a.m. And that's it between then and 6 a.m. It's popular with people who do shift work. Most of the people who do this class are in the restaurant business. Well. That's a bit early for me, but a 6 a.m. start is what I was looking for. A lot of gyms in the area start at 7 a.m., and that's just too late for me, as I have a bit of a commute to get to work. Yes, we recently changed our timetable so we could accommodate people in the same position as you. What type of qualifications do your staff have? All of them have a university qualification in physical fitness, and many of them specialize in different areas such as weights training or distance running. We have 40 personal trainers on staff and many of these are course instructors as well. That sounds good. What are the membership fees? We have three tiers of membership. They all provide the same facilities but they are based on length of membership. You can be a three-year, annual or monthly member. The first costs £50 a month, annual membership is £60 per month and monthly is £70 per month. Are there any extra sign-up fees? Usually there is an extra £25 administration fee for signing up, but at the moment we have a special deal for new members that waives that fee, so it wouldn't cost you any extra. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. What kind of equipment do you have? At my last gym, we had to queue for the treadmills and then we were limited to 20 minutes on them. Do you have the same policy? Absolutely not. We have enough treadmills to accommodate everyone, even on days when the gym is full. We have 40 of them and 10 rowing machines. The gym must be huge. We have more than 400 square meters as we take up the entire second floor of the building. The building is called the Old Shoe Factory and is almost 150 years old. Where is it? Is it in the center of town? It's not right in the center, but on the edge of the old town, next to the railway station at 116 Spring Street. The building has been converted into a small shopping center, so when you come to the gym, you can also do your supermarket shopping at the same time. Can I enroll online? For members who want to renew or update their membership, there is a page on our website that they can access to do this. 
But for first-time members, we ask that they come in to see the gym to decide if they want to become a member. You would need to sign a contract to get membership, so you can't do that online. So, do I need to book a time? You can come in at any time between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., and the reception staff will show you the gym. Okay, I'll come in on Thursday for a look around. Then that's the only day I can manage this week, so I'll have to make a note to myself. Thank you very much for all the information. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a police officer talking about new traffic rules. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. I'd like to introduce local police officer Sergeant Ronald Baker, who is going to tell us about the new road rules in this town and some old ones that you are possibly not aware of. What are the new rules, Sergeant? Thank you for having me here today. There are quite a few new road and traffic rules that some people might not be aware of. The first of which is the new system for cars in the center of town. Apart from those of residents and cars driven by the disabled, the only private cars that can be driven in the central zone of the city are electric vehicles. This rule came into force last weekend, and it seems many people are not yet aware of it, as we have pulled over more than 500 people trying to enter the town in petrol-driven cars. At the moment, we are just giving warnings, but from the beginning of next week, there will be a one hundred pound fine for any unauthorized petrol cars found trying to enter the city. Residents of the centre have been given three years to purchase an electric car, and they must prominently display their resident badge on the windscreen of their car at all times. Taxis will also have to upgrade to electric within three years. Cars registered as vintage are also included in the ban. Next month, we are starting a tree planting program in some areas of the centre, which were previously available for parking. This is part of the local council's new city greening program. Parking in the centre has been restricted, even for electric cars. In the three main streets, Finley, Buckingham, and Waterloo streets, there is no parking allowed at all. Traffic is still able to drive through the streets, but there is no parking. There is an exception for delivery vehicles, which can park for ten minutes only. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty. There are also some new speed limits for 500 meters on either side of hospitals and schools. The new speed limit, which was previously 20 miles an hour, will be 10 miles an hour. The signs have all been changed, so keep an eye out for the new speed limits. It is now compulsory for all dogs in the car to be belted into position. Larger dogs can use regular seat belts, but smaller dogs in cars to be belted into position. 
but smaller dogs and cats must be contained in carrier boxes. No dogs can roam freely within a car. This rule came about not only because some animals within cars were causing accidents because they were distracting drivers, but also in many accidents, animals have caused injury to passengers. Also, in addition to children, now no animals are to be left alone in cars. If this occurs, police officers now have the power to break the windows of cars to release them. There are also new pedestrian rules for the streets, which have trams in them. It is now forbidden to cross the road except at traffic lights or pedestrian crossings. Forty new pedestrian crossings have been installed around the town centre, and the fine for crossing the road incorrectly is £60. With all these new pedestrian crossings, the traffic police are coming down hard on drivers who do not stop for pedestrians. Fifty new bicycle parking racks have been placed around the street, and more are yet to come. This is because the new bicycle parking regulations means that bicycles can no longer be chained to lampposts and railings, and parking is restricted to bicycle racks. This law has been brought in because many badly parked bicycles were blocking access to disabled people in wheelchairs. If there are not enough bicycle racks in your area, you are asked to contact the local council online and inform them of where there is an absence of bicycle parking space. And a reminder to all people who own skateboards, roller skates, mini scooters. These and any unregistered road vehicles other than a bicycle or wheelchair are not allowed to be used on roads or pedestrian pavements. The only places where they can be legally used are on bicycle lanes. The fine for breaking this rule is £60. Oh, and by the way, a very important new rule that everyone should be aware of is that all cyclists must now wear regulation helmets. In the past, it was just for children under 16. But now, the rule is in effect for everyone on a bicycle, no matter their age or experience. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear three students, Mark, Stephanie and Joseph, telling their tutor about a project they are doing on the process of shearing wool from sheep that they have to present as part of their university course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Hello Mark, Stephanie and Joseph. Today I want to hear about your paper on the process of shearing sheep. I see you have brought in some wool samples to show me. What are these, Mark? They are examples of wool from different breeds of sheep. The finer the wool, the more valuable it is. Look, this one here is from a merino ship. Merino wool is the finest in the world and is usually bought by weavers who make the cloth for very expensive business suits. What's the measurement for fineness, Stephanie? It's in microns. One micron is a thousandth of a millimetre. Merino wool is usually between 15 and 20 microns. What are the other breed samples you've got, Mark? The second one is from a Dorset horn sheep, and we think it's about 30 microns. It's used in cheaper woolen clothing. And then this one is from a crossbreed. 
It's probably about 40 microns. This wool is usually used in carpets because it is so tough. Joseph, I see you have a layout of the shearing shed in front of you. What does that show? It's the shearing process. The sheep have their wool cut off or shorn once a year, and it is quite a production line. Is it completely mechanized? No, it's still highly manual. Why is that? Because sheep are on farms. There would be no financial sense in installing a fully mechanized process to shear them when it is just once a year and only a few thousand sheep on each farm. The shearers have to work incredibly hard, but because they are dealing with living animals, they need to be handled very carefully. As a result, the process has barely changed in a hundred years, except that the tools to cut the wool, the shears, have been electrified since the 1950s. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. So, what is the process? You start, Stephanie. It all takes place in a big wooden structure called a shearing shed. The sheep are rounded up outside by sheep dogs and put into holding pens. The sheep are then herded up a ramp into the shearing shed. A shearer picks up a sheep and puts it on its back and shears the sheep, starting from the belly. Shearing takes about two minutes per sheep and some shearers can shear a thousand sheep a day. What happens then, Mark? The shorn sheep is released into a chute in the floor so it can run down to an outside pen. The wool, which is called the fleece, comes off in one flat piece. It is thrown onto a table to be cleaned of leaves and debris, and loose or dirty pieces of wool are removed. Then it is inspected by a person called a wool classer, who is able to estimate the fineness of the wool by looking at it. The wool is then rolled up and put into a wool bin to be pressed into a bale. A bale is made up of about 60 fleeces and weighs a minimum of 120 kilos. The hydraulic wool presser mechanically forces the wool into standard bale sizes contained in square nylon bags. The babies are then dropped down a chute to a storage area. They are put on a truck with a forklift and sent to a wool-receiving warehouse, where they are sorted into groups according to quality and fineness. The bales are weighed and core-tested to make sure the wool class's decision at the shearing shed has been accurate. The bales are later sold at auction. What part of the process are you all interested in making improvements to, Joseph? It is all very efficient, but, as I said before, the shearer's job is extremely laborious. The sheep are heavy and not easy to control, and the shearer has to bend over all day to shear the sheep. They are not paid by the hour, but by the number of sheep they shear. So they are under pressure to shear as many sheep as possible. We wanted to come up with some way of controlling the sheep so the fleece is easier to remove, rather than just relying on the strength of the shearer. But we haven't been able to come up with a better process. Perhaps you should change the focus of your report to why this is the most efficient method and why other techniques have failed over the years. It's a bit disappointing, but it looks like that is what we are going to have to do. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about trypophobia, a fear of holes. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Trypophobia is an affliction that is also known as the fear of holes. In about 16% of us, it manifests itself as a psychological feeling of disgust at the sight of clusters of holes seen, for example, in the patterns that are made in honeycomb, different types of sponges, skin pores, seed pods, shower heads, some wallpaper designs, and even the arrangement of seeds on strawberries. The sight of objects like these causes some people's stomachs to turn and skin to crawl. Trypophobia, from the Greek trypa, meaning hole, has garnered recent attention because of new academic interest, and this is boosted by the fact that it seems so irrational a condition. Although not officially recognized as a mental disorder. It has in the past been identified as a specific phobia. The people who suffer from this disorder do not want to look at or even be near such objects, and it has long been thought it may have an evolutionary basis and might be even more common than previously thought. Past research in trypophobia has focused on linking the reactions to similar phobias, such as fear of snakes and spiders, which are the most common phobias and plainly have some logic behind them. The same repeating pattern of a cluster of holes is found on the surface of a snake's skin, or on a spider's legs. These kinds of low-level visual patterns can help us react quickly to dangerous situations by giving us a lot of information that then does not have to be processed mentally. There is an instant reaction to escape the potential danger ruled by the sympathetic nervous system, which is an automatic system. Just viewing images of threatening animals can create a reaction of fear in many people, sending a rush of hormones to increase the body's alertness and heart and breathing rate, and sending extra blood to the muscles. This is called the fight or flight reaction, and is usually related to the emotion of fear. So, until fairly recently, it was thought that trypophobia was a phobic reaction caused by holes being similar to some features of dangerous animals. But new studies are revealing that this might not be the case, and trypophobia may not even be a phobia at all. It may, in fact, be a rational response, and a phobia is not rational. It all comes down to the actual difference between disgust and fear. One study tested the movement of pupils when confronted with the holy images. The fear response is for pupils to dilate, but with disgust, the pupils constrict, and the muscles around the eyes contract, and our eyes narrow. Whether this movement is to improve focus or protect the eyes is unclear, but it is a vastly different response. In the study, the response of the usual 16% who have trypophobia was that of disgust. The other subjects had little or no reaction. When in the same study, participants were confronted with images of dangerous animals. Most of them showed the typical fear reaction of dilating pupils, many more than had shown the trypophobic response. Also included in the experiment as a control were neutral patterned images not found in nature, such as checkerboards. These did not elicit any reaction.
This showed that though both clusters of holes and images of dangerous animals can both create adverse reactions, these reactions are quite different from one another. Because the reaction to holes was disgust rather than fear, it was suggested that rather than being related to a fear of speckled animals, as previously thought, it may be more due to holes resembling parasitic infections and decomposition. This would require further research. However, the debate on the relationship between fear and disgust has been going on among scientists since the 19th century. This new finding increases the evidence that the two, despite occasionally happening at the same time, have different neural and physiological formations. Both outcomes of how the visual system stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. This has opened up other questions such as what other phobic reactions may have similar outcomes. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.